We are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. Okay, I'm ready to commence. Um, dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Cyril Obi as our uh, as our uh, honored keynote speaker. Dr. Obi has been a leader in the study of conflict, peace, and international relations in Africa. I think it's especially appropriate that it be he who address uh, who addresses a conference that has multidimensionality of security uh, issues at its center. Dr. Obi has worked across a very wide array of issues in his long career, including insurgency, peacekeeping, globalization, democracy, environmental security. And I want to underline in particular his contributions to understanding the linkages among economics, the environment, and armed conflict, uh, in particular in his work on insurgency in the Niger, in the Niger Delta, uh, which it, uh, asks us to examine critically how oil economies and global economic processes intersect with class conflict and, and identity politics. Um, he's the author of, I think it's four books from what I get to this, is, is, his publications are, are uh, quite lengthy and, um, and dozens of articles. Uh, the most recent book that he's written is Developmental Regionalism and Economic Transformation uh, in Southern Africa, which came out with Rutledge in 2020. Also in 2020, he uh, re received the Distinguished Scholar Award from the Peace Studies section of the International Studies Association. Dr. Obi is therefore a major uh, scholar who has contributed to uh, the understanding of the multidimensionality of security issues in Africa. And he's also an, intellect an intellectual leader. Uh, he's currently program leader at the Social Sciences Research Council in New York, where he, he heads up two programs, the African Peacebuilding Network and the Next Generation Social Sciences in Africa programs. And I had the great pleasure over lunch to be able to discuss uh, with Dr. Obi a little bit more about what those programs entail and they're uh, developing um, the, the next generation of, uh, of scholars um, in Africa and based in Africa, from Africa and based in Africa. Um, he uh, previously served among other positions, for example, as a leader of the research cluster on conflict displacement and transformation uh, at the uh, Nordic Africa Institute uh, at Uppsala as well. Uh, Dr. Obi's talk today is entitled Redemocracy democratizing Africa again, engaging emerging uh, challenges to peace and security in a time of crises. Without further ado, I'm very pleased uh, to turn it over to uh, Dr. Obi. Uh, thank you very much, Theo. Um, First of all, I want to thank the Network for Strategic Analysis for inviting me to give uh, this uh, presentation. Um, I must confess that this is the first time I've left home in two years for another country. So uh, it's a bit um, interesting that um, Canada and uh, actually Montreal was the first place I had to come to. Secondly is that I don't uh, have much French. I always tell people, je parle un peu de français, which means I speak little French, and that's about it. Um, coming at the end of a very long day in which there have been very many interesting presentations and robust debates, I, I hope I don't send you to sleep. Uh, because I come to the issue of peace and security from this very interesting animal called democracy. And I'm going to argue that in Africa, what Africa needs is to re-democratize on new terms. And my argument is that rather than deal with peace and security essentially as something that is you can approach from a military perspective, or even something that you can deal with, capture, and then crush, so to speak, in terms of threats, that this is something that has to do with our humanity as a people uh, and what we are and the values that we treasure and how we consider ourselves human beings. And for me, democracy is the, at the heart that it's only when people are free that they can be secure. It's only when they are not afraid that their liberties will be taken from them that they can be secure. And it is only under those conditions that you can have real peace, durable peace. And it's only when they have to, they don't have to go to bed hungry or live in poverty. So I have this very interesting approach 
uh, their distinguished colleagues to the whole question of democracy and what it means to re-democratize. Thirdly, is, is the whole question of the times we live in. Everywhere, democracy is being challenged. And it's such an interesting thing that I call it, and it's not original, permit me to say, the anxieties of democracy. That we live in a time of great anxiety for what is going to happen to democracy, what is going to happen to our world, what is going to happen to those that will come after us, what is going to happen to our children, what kind of world are they going to uh, inherit? We begin to reimagine these things. I hope I don't send you to sleep, but here it is, um, the presentation. We are living in interesting times, a time of great upheavals and uncertainties, unprecedented opportunities and hope. As the world gradually emerges from a pandemic of epic proportions and faces threats to the multilateral order that has endured strains and stresses since the end of the since the end of World War II and the still evolving post-Cold War order, the time has come to rethink the foundational democratic principles, norms, and relationships underpinning society. This will require, among other things, rediscovering innovative ways and tools for transforming our world along more equitable, emancipatory, and peaceful directions. We also need to specifically address the strengths to the ne neoliberal order and its broader ramifications for peace, development, and security. Of note is a vital role of democracy, which is caught in crisis and uncertainty, given the persistence of deepening socioeconomic inequalities, social injustice, and the steady rise of far right wing groups in old democracies, as well as similar tendencies in their mainstream parties with implications for social harmony, progress, and freedom. The global context provides a backdrop for unpacking the complex crisis confronting Africa, which has remained a site for competing global, regional, state, and non-state interests and multilateral actors. The complex crisis in the region is being exacerbated by governance deficits, widespread social decay, poverty and corruption. Failed economic policies have undermined the social fabric in many countries, a situation that has become complicated by anti-people policies, capital flight, debt crisis, climate change, demograph demographic change, and human mobilities and disconnections that contribute to a mix of growing insecurities. However, Amidst this grim scenario, we cannot lose hope, both in terms of the re remarkable resilience that is being shown, as well as the possibilities led by a younger generation seeking change and driving growing demands and pressures for democracy from below. There are strong signs of a democratic regression on the continent, marked by controversial elections the elongation of presidential tenures by manipulating constitutions and parliaments, and high levels of corruption, impunity, and violence. Although the levels of COVID-19 infection and related deaths have been low compared to other regions of the world, the pandemic has had a devastating impact on African economies, disrupted education, and deepened socioeconomic inequalities and inequities that disproportionately affect women. While there, is, there are no indications of a spike in levels of violence during the pandemic, its adverse socioeconomic impact has contributed towards democratic, democratic regression, either by governments manipulating COVID-19 protocols and restrictions to undermine and curtail human rights, postpone elections, or divert resources towards the militarization of society, or fighting perennial wars against insurgency or terrorism. It is also noteworthy that this period has also witnessed the overthrow of several democratically elected governments in the face of deepening crisis of state legitimacy, interrogation of regional peace and security mechanisms, and the redefinition of Africa's place in the still evolving global geopolitics that threatens to re-marginalize the continent 
through a new scramble for markets and resources and a new Cold War. Between democracy and insecurity. There are several issues that lie at the heart of the nexus between democracy, peace, and security in Africa. Can Africa democratize under conditions of instability, inequality, and crisis of governance? How can we move democracy beyond the shadow of periodic elections that offer no real choice beyond legitimizing authoritarian rule, which then priv privileges violent rather than peaceful methods as the main ch channel for seeking real political change? What can be done to support internal social force forces fighting for democracy in an era where democratic gains made decades ago are being eroded by a complex set of forces and factors? Several commentators have observed that the momentum that greeted the third wave of democracy, which witnessed popular uprisings that led to the fall of several dictators and one-party states in Africa in the 1990s is fast fading. In the face of the recent upsurge in authoritarian manipulation of constitutions and elections, as well as military coup d'etat. The emerging scenario is one that unfortunately provides a context for the changing trajectories of intrastate conflict, driven by a diverse set of factors, ranging from violent extremism to insurgencies by groups seeking self-determination, or youth protesting against unemployment, human rights abuses, state repression, and high levels of corruption. Africa is caught somewhere between hope and despair. Authoritarianism and a potential fourth wave of democracy. Amy Nyang refers to the current situation as, I quote, a historical shift, but also a harbinger of an uncharted future, end quote. She further acknowledges the strong desire for change, real change. However, the question remains, will a fourth wave be qualitatively different from the third wave of the 1990s that received widespread international acclaim and support? What type of democracy can deliver peace, security, and equitable development to ordinary Africans? Will the new internal impetus for alternate, alternative politics and a paradigm shift in politics receive the support of the international community? There is a sense in which the conundrum of illiberal democracy, authoritarianism, and structural violence continues to reproduce and feed cycles of violence and instability and constrain efforts to build durable peace on the continent. In spite of the millions of dollars poured into election and democracy pr promotion, stabilization, peace support, peace building, security and development, counterinsurgency, such efforts and initiatives have either achieved limited success or outright failure or even fueled more crises. Although Africans clearly prefer democracy to other forms of governance, the problem lies with the kinds of illiberal democracies that have been foisted on them against their will. According to a survey by Afro Barometer in 2021, seven in 10 Africans reported that democracy is preferable to any other form of government, underscoring their rejection of authoritarianism. The 2020 Freedom in the World Report also notes that 22 African countries recorded declines in democratic governance and human rights, the second highest figures during a period of global deterioration. I have argued elsewhere, and I quote, that African democracy is at the crossroads, confronted by an upsurge in young voices, protesting the rising tide of misgovernance laced with impunity, police, police brutality, gender-based violence and poverty, unquote. There are several trends in the erosion of democracy in Africa. Africans, particularly the youth, are engaging in popular protests and struggles for greater inclusion and participation in democracy with far-reaching implications for peace and security on the continent. So let's look at the various ways through which democracy has been subverted. The first is extension and removal of constitutional provisions on term limits. The social upheavals sweeping across the continent underscore the irrelevance of facade democracies on the continent. They are the result of actions of illiberal Democrats seeking to perpetuate themselves in power by manipulating constitutional processes 
or prompting pliant parliaments to pass laws extending or removing term limits regarding the presidential tenures or the number of times an incumbent can stand for elections. The independence and operations of electoral commissions are also compromised to facilitate the manipulation of elections and influence outcomes. In this regard, two term limits on presidential tenures have been removed in some countries such as Guinea, Togo, Uganda, Chad, Rwanda, Egypt, Burundi, and La Côte d'Ivoire. Let's look at the liberation movements. In other contexts, particularly those where liberation movement or armies have been transformed via elections into ruling governments, they have basically turned their countries into de facto one-party states, perpetrating themselves in power after successive elections. Examples include Eritrea, Tanzania, South Africa, Namibia, Angola, Zimbabwe, and Algeria, among others, where parties bearing the banner of a legacy of the struggle for liberation legitimize their hold on power, ruling through a mix of patronage politics, repression and impunity, often labeling the opposition as enemies of the people or agents of foreign powers keen on undermining the legacies of the liberation struggle. In such contests, the prospects of political participation are rather dim and the ruling parties continue to use the state's resources to tighten its grip on power. Choiceless democracies. The notion of choiceless democracies is based on the view by the late Nigerian political economist, Clodake, that when democracies are devalued to the extent that they no longer threaten the hold of a small ruling elite in power, they disempower the electorate and offer citizens with no real choice. It is a political system where factions of the same elite or ruling families take turns in ruling the country, much like a game of musical chairs. They offer no real change in terms, of, in terms of what they do, marginalizing, repressing, and rendering the alienated majority powerless. Thus, when such countries go through the motions of elections, social inequalities widen, and the standard of living continues to plummet. Corruption, widespread poverty, and the decay of public institutions and services fuel grievances from the excluded majority which in turn feeds social discontent and popular protests against the state, which is seen increasingly as distant, irrelevant, and illegitimate, and therefore can be challenged. Several countries have been held captive by long-serving authoritarian leaders, maintaining a stranglehold over political power, and suppressing any attempt at forming a viable political op opposition. Example of, examples of this trend include Equatorial Guinea, where despite holding elections since 1991, President Teodoro Obiang Basongo has held on to power for close to 43 years. In neighboring Cameroon, President Paul Bia has also been in power for maybe about 39 years. Despite, and so despite successful elections, successive elections, he has been able to hold on to power by dividing and repressing the opposition and civil society. He legitimized his grip on power by getting the country's parliament to pass an amendment in 2008, removing constitutional limits on presidential terms. Another Central African uh, country, Congo Brazzaville, has been ruled by President Sassou Nguesu since 1979 save for between 1992 and 1997. Similarly, he has won successful elections like his regional counterparts. These scenarios have been replicated across other parts of Africa. With democratic norms and practices being undermined and subverted, politics has, become a constant, has been in a constant state of flux or disequilibrium in which governments are constantly buffeted by demands for citizens for access to a better quality of life, basic welfare services, infrastructure, and security. They often rely on a mix of cooptation, divide and rule, propaganda, and promises for a, for a better future alongside a healthy dose of repression. To hold on to power. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has deepened socioeconomic inequalities, 
there is an increasing impatience among the population with choiceless democracies, particularly those that seek to elongate their stay in power or becoming more authoritarian, as can be seen in their response to their failure to provide basic needs and securities. But the crisis of legitimacy faced by such democratic governments and their inability to, to effectively govern in the interests of the people open up spaces for protest, dissent, insurgent violence by non-state actors and now military intervention. And so I've asked the question, do we have a new generation of military coups? Until fairly recently, military governments, most of which had earlier collapsed or handed over power to democratically elected governments through multi-party elections had largely become an aberration in Africa. However, in the past 18 months, they have staged a comeback. Africa has experienced five military coups in which democratic governments were overthrown in Chad, Mali, Guinea, Sudan, and Burkina Faso by young military officers in their 30s and 40s. This trend has not only set off alarm bells across the continent, but in many global capitals concerned about the possibility of a spread of coups and the further destabilization of entire regions with implications for international peace and security. It is important to note that several of the coups were preceded either by massive street protests by youth against years of misrule. The new generation of young military heads of state have so far not provided any radically different roadmap for a return to democracy or advanced a clear agenda for political transformation. For example, while the new military rulers in Burkina Faso are promising a three-year transition, those in Mali have proposed a five-year transition, and the military ruler of Chad has promised a one-year transition. There is also some difference in the way citizens have responded in different countries. While interventions in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso were greeted by public demonstrations of support, the situation in Sudan has been different, and demonstrators protesting against the military are demanding popular democratic rule. In neighboring Chad, there were also protests against the coup by the late president's son, Mohamed Debi. While military interventions in West African Sahel have occurred against the background of increased levels of insurgency by Islamist extremist groups, the effects of the pandemic and public disaffection with government's inability to protect local populations has been a factor to consider. Although it is early days yet, and most of the new military governments making symbolic gestures, such as the formation of civilian or military-led transitional ruling councils, are convening, military, uh, convening national dialogues, there is no doubt about where true power lies. And if the widespread support that the, military, that the new military governments enjoy would translate in the long term into the transformation of the relations of power between state and society, youth groups and members of the political opposition is something that we should continue to watch. With the, adv with the advance of the militarization of politics, albeit by a new generation of military rulers that are either riding on a wave of popular power, as in the case of some of the countries of the Sahel, or seeking to neutralize such forces, as in the case of Chad and Sudan, it is appropriate to analyze the response to emerging trends at the regional and global levels. Before returning to the fundamental question of whether what we are witnessing is support for military rule or the perception that the military is the only viable option for getting rid of discredited, choiceless democracies and inept, sit-tight rulers. The limits of regional responses. Expectedly, the implications of the democratic regression and coup d'etat have not been lost to many analysts who are equally critical of the limitations inherent in the responses of the African Union and regional economic communities. We are witnessing a situation in which the AU and ECOWAS norms for preventing or penalizing unconstitutional changes of power have practically become ineffective. Critics note that ECOWAS protocol on democracy and good governance 
an AU's African Charter on Democracy, elections and governance, which are often invoked to suspend membership of countries that engage in unconstitutional or military coups, have often, been turned, have often turned a blind eye to unconstitutional extensions of power, misrule, and the suppression of legitimate protests. They often refer to the neglect of widespread grievances against the government deficits in, in Guinea, Mali, and Burkina Faso that contributed to the coups. For instance, the ECOWAS imposed economic and diplomatic sanctions of Mali following the May 2021 coup in the country. Not only did Somalians take to the streets after the country's new leaders condemned the action of the regional body, neighboring Guinea, which later had a military coup, dissociated itself from ECOWAS's action. A proposal by France, Mali's former colonial power, to the UN Security Council to sanction the military government for extending its political transition program till 2026 was blocked by China and Russia. A similar case occurred after the coup in Guinea in September 2021, when opposition leaders expressed support for the coup. In the same regard, thousands of Guinean protesters poured out into the streets to protest ECOWAS's sanctions. According to a Guinean activist, Ibrahim Solimara, I quote, where was ECOWAS when Alpha Conde was changing the constitution? Where was ECOWAS when Alpha Conde wanted to run for a third term? Where was ECOWAS when the people of Guinea were suffering injustice, inequality? Where was ECOWAS? Unquote. In neighboring Burkina Faso, where a coup took place, resulting in the overthrow of President Rokma Christian Kabori in January 2022, crowds demonstrating their support for the putsch similarly condemned ECOWAS's stance. But even then, when 78-year-old President Ouattara of Côte d'Ivoire went back on his initial promise to leave power after serving two terms, contested and won a third term without much protest from ECOWAS or AU. While Muhammad Debi, who seized power in charge after his father's death, did not face any sanctions from the EU. While it could be argued that the limits of regional responses affect the fraying legitimacy of the AU and, and Rex, as well as increasing relevance of the obsession with constitutional order. The question remains, what needs to be done to restore the legitimacy and authority of AU and African Rex to develop new and appropriate tools for defending democracy and addressing the structural drivers of conflict and instability among member states? And let's look at the international dimension. While the drift towards democratic regression can be attributed to the failure of the political class to run inclusive governments based on socially equitable policies and the weaknesses of regional mechanisms designed to prevent unconstitutional change of power, the situation has become more complicated by the international actors and mechanisms. This trend has taken several forms. Of note is the militarization of international partnerships that have tended to prioritize short-term hard security and strategic interests over long-term human development, social justice, and human security calculations. With more emphasis placed on countering violent extremism and the fight against local affiliates of global jihadist terrorist groups through initiatives such as the G5 and special military training partnerships and strategic economic interests, while neglecting or overlooking the governance deficits and excesses of local ruling elites, sections of the international community have become part of the conflict dynamics of various parts of Africa. In her analysis of France's waning influence in the West African Sahel, Amy Yang points to how French interests have been embedded in long-standing clientelist relations with former African colonies in order to access natural resources and in a geopolitical contest with Russia. Equally significant, are the shifting geopolitical dynamics that has witnessed the growing decline of French power in Francophone Africa, particularly among the gen younger generation of Africans. Inroads into the continent by emerging powers and other states such as China, Russia, the Arab Gulf states, 
Turkey and Saudi Arabia who are jostling for influence, even as Western powers, including but not limited to the US and UK, struggle to retain influence on the continent in the face of competing domestic and global challenges. The securitization of the region has also fueled the leveraging of military responses and interventions in response to the spread of jihadist and insurgent groups. Amy Yang explains the consequences of this trend in the form of the proliferation of armed groups in response to perceived arbitrary injustice in relation to both state and jihadi groups and the labeling and targeting of dissenters or opposition elements as terrorists by states which also take advantage of international resources and support for the war on terrorists to reinforce their repressive capacities. All too often at the, experience, at the expense of delivering public goods, basic freedoms and security to their own people. The militarization of security and development aid in the region also reflects in the background of the military officers behind the most recent rash of coups. According to Ebenezer Obadali, I quote, they all received their training in the West, unquote. He further notes that, I quote, both Derby and Amoeba trained in France, while Goita trained in France, Germany, and the United States, including a stint with the US Army Special Forces, unquote. In most cases, these officers have been part of the elite or special core of their country's armed forces with close proximity to those wielding political power and by implication, international security partnerships. The changing geopolitical landscape marked by the emergence of new threats ranging from highly mobile transnational armed groups, the deleterious effects of climate change on already dire environmental and socioeconomic conditions of deepening inequality, poverty, and youth unemployment provide a combustible mix that is further complicated by a new scramble for natural resources and spheres of influence by competing established and emerging powers. The recent coups may yet be one of the unintended consequences of building the capacities of African militaries for counterinsurgency and stabilization operations. The international template of democracy pr promotion, electoral democracy and constitutional order through support for free and fair elections, election observation, support for electoral, ma for electoral management institutions, training and sensitization programs for civil society, electoral officials and law enforcement agencies may have contributed to the capacity to conduct elections but it is difficult to tell the extent that these have translated into the institutionalization of the principles and norms of democratic governance. If the evidence of the state of democracy on the continent is anything to go by, it suggests that elections have not led to political participation and change. Secondly, is the standard template of the international community relating to the issue of post-conflict or transitional elections, which are often short. These tend to be focused excessively on exit elections in conflict-affected settings that are usually bereft of sustained reconciliation based on sustained engagement and dialogue between erstwhile opposing political groups on how to effectively address long-standing grievances. The quick exit option and attention on the big players often suggests that the foundations and scaffolding for democratic transitions are often brittle and susceptible to collapse further down the road. Another related point that has come up frequently in the literature relates to the gaps and incoherence in the strategies and policies of regional organizations, the international community and neighboring states towards states in transition towards democracy. Such cracks and inconsistencies often send conflicting signals to incumbents in power or their chosen successors, which in turn contributes to the fragility of the democratic project. 
A factor that is not often obvious is the way in which international security partnerships, particularly those of a military nature, are sometimes instrumentalized by wily African leaders who strategically channel resources to bolster their state's repressive capacities while systematically underfunding some sections of the military. A point also made by Nyang in relation to the situation in Mali before the coup. It is a situation that occurs in varying degrees across the region, calling attention to the need to re-examine the cleavages and grievances within the militaries and how this plays into local politics. The issue of providing international support for peace and security calls for a paradigm shift based on a deep knowledge of the changing social dynamics and a sound understanding of the areas of potential positive impact in the countries across the region. Africa's future lies in the hands of its youth and the growing emphasis for redemocratization and a generational power shift. The international community will need to understand the codes and nuances of the emerging forces of change in Africa. Drawing on research and a careful reading of alternate politics and moving away from outmoded paradigms that are fast being, outmoded, that, that are fast being outpaced by social struggles, innovative technologies, regional and global transformations. And so I try to hazard a way forward. The way forward out of the multiple crises confronting peace and security in Africa lies in the transformation of the state and politics along radically participatory and developmental democratic lines. I argue that what Africa needs is not more of the same form of delegitimized democracy, but transformative and de developmental democracy that places the people their inclusion and participation in politics and governance at its core. Democracy should be on their own terms, not imposed, and should prioritize their demands for the freedom to participate in governance and a life of dignity as equal citizens. This suggests a democracy that is substantially different from the third wave that swept across the continent in the 1990s. It will require a new impetus from across society in a fourth wave that will re-democratize the continent along more egalitarian, equitable, and participatory terms as foundational steps towards a just peace and a people-centered peace and security architecture. Peace can no longer be imposed from outside or from the top down. It has to be grown from the ground up. The role of the international community is first to understand the new social impetus for political change in Africa and retool its strategies for supporting capacities of Africans who daily struggle to redemocratize their societies and transform their lives. It will involve renegotiating the terms of engagement with Africa as an equal partner, investing in the co-production of knowledge, supporting the building of new capable and participatory institutions, and supporting social justice initiatives that add value to the lives of the people. The capacity of states should be supported to deliver sustainable development, while also expanding their access to global markets. It should, however, be noted that no matter how supportive the international community is, African elites and people should take the lead in negotiating the new social contract that will emancipate long-suffering citizens and embark on, on, and embark on re democratizing the continent in ways that will guarantee freedom and form a durable basis for equitable peace and security. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Obi. Um, so we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, Dr. Naim, can you let me know if there are questions from uh, the Zoom audience, please, uh, using uh, their book? Feel free to pose your questions. I'm, you can't hear me. <laughs> 
folks on the Zoom, I'm sorry, uh, can feel free to pose their questions either on the chat uh, or uh, by raising their virtual hands, and we'll we'll get them. Um, we'll we'll repeat them and be able to, to ask them from of Dr. Opie. Uh, otherwise, if there are questions uh, from audience members, please feel free, and we'll uh, distribute the microphone. So, Bruno, Shabano. Uh, Thank you, Professor. Uh, very interesting. Uh, lots to talk about. Uh, I, th this year's a 20th anniversary, as you know, of the African Union. I want to ask you what you think of the African Union. You, you've, you, you've made that clear, but uh, the African Union is also a symbol of Pan-Africanism, and you've talked about Africa as a whole in many ways. So I was just wondering about the state of the Pan-African project. Uh, is it dead? Is it still alive somewhere? Can it help or contribute to your argument about redemocratization of Africa? Um, so yeah, so I'd like to hear you about uh, Pan-Africanism. Thank you. So I don't know if this is on. It's on? Okay. I don't know if I should take this or I should collect questions. Either one is fine by me. Okay, why don't you answer? Thank you very much. I, I think that's a very good question. Um, now, one of the things I argued about was the need for a generational shift in power. And so, yes, the Pan-African project is alive. But the question is, whose Pan-African project is it? Now, when you look at the AU critically, it's kind of become, over the years, and I'm not saying that it's not had its uses. The African Union has been very useful. And at the time it was born or it was formed, it actually lived up to expectation. But my argument is that the social dynamics, the rate at which the social dynamics in Africa is unfolding is such that it is outpacing the capacity of the African Union to cope. And it's actually trying to play catch up. But again, the African Union is caught up in a particular image that is formed by the elite who control power in a lot of these African countries. And my basic argument is that the models of democracy that they are running more or less do not respond to the yearnings and aspirations of the younger people. The younger people are imagining and dreaming of a different kind of Africa. The fundamental question then is, is the African Union going to respond or live up to those dreams? Or is it going to continue to try to reproduce the old models of what I call the constitutional orders, which as you can see, are no longer holding the peace. And that's why this becomes so critical in this discussion. We really can't talk about peace and security if you cannot have what I call political containers that are flexible and expansive enough to respond to the people to deliver develop, development in real terms to them. So that is what the argument is. So the state of the Pan-African project is that the Pan-African project is in a state where it's looking to the past but it's also at a juncture where it can only be transformed if there's real change. So that is my answer. I don't know if I answered your question, but it's, it's a time for change for the Pan-African project. Yes, it's lived evolve. very long. It has to evolve. Where, if I can just quickly follow up. So where, where are those sources of a new form of Pan-Africanism? The new social movements? Or is that he, the, that's an interesting thing. It's, it's a process that is ongoing. Now, when you look at the protests that are swept across the, the continent, particularly the new protests that are not just the ones in the streets, but the ones in the social media. For example, in Nigeria, there was NSAS. In Burkina Faso, you had a lot of them. What, something happened in Senegal not too long ago. They are all scattered episodes that are, that are happening all over the place. So you have them in the streets, you have them in cyberspace, you have them on, in university college uh, campuses. You have them among 
progressive sectors of the middle class. You even have them in social movements, but they have not come together. And one of the things we have seen in the kind of dynamics that is unraveling across the place is that because they do not see change coming through the ballot box, some of them have supported the new generation of military rulers, hoping perhaps that if those people are able to take out or remove the, demo the illiberal Democrats that have stood in the way of the evolving democratic project, then a new democracy can be born. But as I said, that is still uncharted territory. We don't know whether this is going to happen or whether the military, once they stay in power for too long, may now turn on their former social allies. They, 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 nobody can really tell at this point what is going to happen because all these schools are still very young. None of them is more than a year or two at the most, except in those countries where, of course, like Sudan, where the military is being confronted by people in the streets and, mo and social movements who are telling them that we want real democracy. I might actually take advantage of the fact that I have the microphone in my hand to ask a question. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to your argument of uh, redemocratizing, um, and I'm wondering in terms of what that looks like and where we start to find answers as to how you know what what it looks like the shape of redemocratization. I'm wondering. I want to get just point to one of the elements you mentioned in your talk. Um, it, it's interesting because I've seen a lot of people cite uh, this data from the Afrobarometer on, um, you know, the significant percentage of Africans wanting democracy. And every time I see these numbers, I wonder, how do they, how do they define democracy? What is it that's inherently appealing about democracy to these um, to these people being polled and to see these numbers. And I think that's, a, that's one of the questions we need to ask because I'm not sure that when Afrobarometer polls them, they necessarily understand democracy as me as an external person understands democracy. And I actually think that there might be some answers in terms of how we look at redemocratization. So I was wondering if, if you could maybe provide us a bit of an answer why, what you think they find inherently attractive and why they're, they're in, in the numbers that they are answering that they actually prefer democracy. I don't know if the question was clear. Yeah, I understand what you're trying to say. Um, it's not a trick question. I'm, I'm just really No, I, I do, I, I understand what you're trying to say. And there, there are various ways of approaching this. I think we have to go back to history. Now, if you look at the history of democracy in Africa, it came via, in many cases, the decolonization route. And so for people, their first encounter or their first approach to democracy was freedom. And that is still there, that for the African, democracy is about freedom. And that is true for the universal principle of democracy everywhere in the world. It's about freedom and it's not different in Africa. African people value freedom. The question then is freedom from what and for what? At the historical moment of decolonization or in the independence movement, there was an alliance between what I call the nationalist elite and the ordinary Africans who were either workers or peasants. And the promise was that once we are able to get the colonial masters out, then you can have democracy, freedom. And I remember that in my country, one of the political, one of the nationalist political parties had an interesting motto called life more abundant. That was democracy, freedom from poverty, freedom from injustice, freedom from fear, insecurity, okay? Access to public goods, water, light, good education, health. Democracy was measured in concrete terms and it has not changed. The question you should ask the young person in the streets 
today is, are they employed? Do they have access to water? Do they have access to electricity? Are, that, are they safe in their homes? Are they free? Now, when you answer those questions, you don't need Afrobarometer. People love democracy. Africans want democracy. But the question is, whose democracy is it? Is it the democracy of the elite? You can argue that from a historical perspective, what happened to that alliance that won independence was that after independence, the nationalist elite, the nationalist elite moved to replace the departing colonial powers with all the perks, with all the privileges. And that alliance that came into power, so to speak, that was elected at the moment of independence broke, it broke up. And so you had this ruling elite up there. And that's what I call the disconnect, the disconnection that took place. And something happened in the 70s and 80s that actually wasn't that disconnect. And that was structural adjustment with the neoliberal market reforms, the rolling back of the state and the liberalization of the economy and the complete erosion of the welfare gains, which had been inherited at independence. People had education because a lot of the governments needed manpower for the civil service. So they had education. There, were, there was a lot of construction that took place. But with structural adjustment and the erosion of the welfare gains and the almost virtual abandonment of social development, our social policy as a government policy, because everything now went to the market. And the things that were so-called uh, privatized, the public institutions that were privatized were basically gobbled up by the local elites and international partners. And people lost jobs, people dropped out of school, and the social conditions became even more difficult, and the population continued to expand. And so these became very difficult uh, social conditions, socioeconomic conditions within which to sustain that democratic promise. And now you have COVID. And so you can see the layering. So the reality is that Africa's democracy in Africa needs to respond to these demands, these basic demands. People want to feel, touch, smell, and experience democracy as something that they can relate to directly that has implications and an impact on their lives because increasingly they see the state as an alien entity that does not respond to these issues anymore. It's no longer the state at independence. It's, not the, it's no longer a state of the people. I hope I'm making sense. So that is why African youth want a different kind of democracy that speaks to their reality, that speaks to their aspirations, that gives them security, food, light, hope for the future. That's why we are arguing and saying, it's not that we are throwing democracy, baby and bath water. What we are saying is that we are asking for re-democratization, a redefinition of what democracy should be, and it should be relevant to what the citizens want, their aspirations and their own development as human beings and their dignity. That's it. I'm going to have to give up, if I may. Um, Thank you, Dr. Obi. Um, like Mahiev, I'm very sympathetic to, you know, the idea that there is discontent, uh, that youth don't feel represented by their elites, and that uh, a renewal of democracy um, is necessary in order to, I'm going to actually take this off because in order to, to, to respond to uh, their aspirations and their concrete needs. What I want to ask you about is how the international context makes this potentially viable or not. And let me say that if I look to Latin America, where youth were marginalized, did not feel represented by elites, uh, had, you know, 
uh, concerns about jobs and what have you, what this gave rise to was, um, you know, populism that was supported by a majority of the population. Yet it was rejected and actually fought by uh, the Western democracies, which uh, basically did not accept the emergence of what was a very local, you may want to call it indigenous way of maybe reorganizing politics in a way that reflected more um, the inclusion of historically excluded sectors of society. And I'm just back from the Sahel where colleagues um, and not necessarily supporters of the military uh, per se, have been talking about the military coup as a democratic coup. Because in many ways, uh, they feel like, you know, the military are responding, as you said, you know, to the frustrations of the population. Do you think that in this context, there is not potential for populism instead of a renewal of democracy? Do you see populism as a potential, you know, stepping stone or point on the way to a renewal of democracy? And how do you think, I mean, you're at SSRC, so how do you think uh, Western partners are likely to respond to the emergence of um, local, not necessarily liberal in our understanding, forms of democracy or, you know, um, of rule that is supported by a majority of the people, but does not look like something that we would uh, label democracy as per our, what I would argue is a narrow understanding. Thank you very much. You've asked uh, not one, not two, <laughs> not even three questions. <laughs> and it's, it's quite, but these are very important questions. And I could pose a question this way. What we have is not working. There have been an attempt to fix it, um, partly through structural adjustment. And what has happened, nobody talks about structural adjustment now, but what has happened is that it actually complicated the problem, unfortunately. And now we have an angry generation and now you have political elites that have run out of solutions. They really don't have the solutions. Uh, the solution they have is to hang on, stay in power, and ask the international community for help in various ways. Uh, but that, again, is not sustainable. The international community, don't forget, now has more responsibilities. There are a lot of domestic challenges in Western democracies now than before. I mean, COVID has exposed a lot of vulnerabilities and domestic policy is now more important than before. And then there are also other competing superpowers to deal with. So the kind of resources that we had in the past uh, in the Western democracies is not what it is. And also part of the problem has now come home to the West in, through migration. And so I'm sure that uh, some people in the West are beginning to think through some of these things, and they are also re beginning to realize that the solution has to be at the, at the root of the problem, to go back, to look at the social triggers and the things that are causing this. In terms of making a choice between re-democratizing and populism, but that's an interesting question. I don't think it's really about making a choice between one or the other. I think what we want to do is to find out what elements. You see, the thing about democracy is that it has universal principles. And one of the things is representation, what is fundamental about freedom. But the way it has been instrumentalized by political elites is completely different. And it varies from one country to the other. But the reality is that whether you're talking of populism or democracy, the reality is it's fundamentally about liberation, about freedom, about people feeling that they are free and they have dignity and they are not afraid and they have access to the basic human needs. Okay? So what happened in Latin America was populism. But again, you need to understand that resistance by people is also tempered by their culture, 
but they are historical experiences. And so the historical experiences of Latin America may not be exactly the same as what happened in Africa. So we may not want to have the same uh, the same soup, so to speak, or the same solutions. So Africa will have to define what it wants to do. But the basic principles of just social justice, equality for all, freedom, those things would cut across both continents. And I think that the people in Africa will have a lot to learn from what happened in Latin America. And I don't know if that is already going on. We need, and that's why I spoke about co-production of knowledge. One of the things the international community can do is to actually enable people from these two regions to learn more about themselves, learn more about, about these issues. And as I said in my presentation, the West also needs to learn more about Africa, the nuances, uh, and, and move away from the old paradigms. The old paradigms are creating more complications. And perhaps the time has come to go back to the basics and say, let's see what we can do to change the mindset, because it's really about a mindset. So go back, what needs to be changed? How do we see Africa? Do we see Africa only as markets and sources of natural resources and a place for influence? Do we see Africa as a place where we are going to wage a new Cold War competing with new emerging powers? Or do we see Africans as being part of the of the sisterhood and brotherhood of humankind that have the right to live in dignity and freedom. How can we support them? How can this be a mutually beneficial relationship, not paternalistic, not one in which it's about extraction, not one in which it's about global hierarchies, but a world where we have a basis for social harmony based on mutual respect equality and dignity. I think it's that the humanity must come to that realization that war does not solve problems and that power in itself should not just be about being in a position where you can force the other to do your will. But power is that capacity to coexist peacefully with mutual respect and to actually work together and reap the benefits of cooperation rather than competition. So co the, the whole basis of real politics, as, as they say, or the zero sum game to politics, either internationally or even internally is something that has to be renegotiated. I think we need a new global compact. And within that new global compact, we should begin to reorganize relationships between peoples from different parts of the world. I don't know if I've answered your question about populism or redemocratizing, but I'm saying that whatever is going on inside, the new social ferment that we're, we're seeing in Africa is something that has to be taken more seriously. It's not a flash in the pan. It's something that has taken a very long time coming, even though we are not certain about what direction is going to lead us. I, 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 I hear you when you say colleagues in Sahel think that it's a democratic coup, but that's an oxymoron. The military, even with their democratic coup, have not been able to articulate a democratic agenda for transformation. Where is that going to come from? The young people who are protesting in the streets do not have one. So there has to be a dialogue. There has to be social dialogue. There has to be national dialogues. People need to sit down negotiate and discuss. What is the international community going to do? Should it facilitate that dialogue or should it look for a way of reproducing in a different form the kind of democracies we have? Or should it go back and say, look, um, let's fix what we have. There's nothing wrong with this vehicle. Just did a, a few tweaks here and there and it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work. I think Africa needs to be redemocratized. What we are doing is not really democracy. Yes, thank you very much. So I hope I've answered your question. Um, thank you very much uh, for your talk, uh, Dr. Obi. Um, I really appreciated the emphasis that you put on democracy in Africa as being about or what I understood to be self-determination, right? Democracy is about freedom. It's about this autonomization within the world. Um, 
One question I have is related to the fact that this is not necessarily liberal democracy in the sense that's understood in the Western world, where liberal democracy goes hand in hand with uh, freedom from religious interference and the separation of church and state and all this kind of thing. Whereas we know that in African life, in African civil society, religion is a fundamental part of everyday life across the board. I'm just wondering what your view is about the relationship and the future relationship between democracy, religion, and security in Francophone and Anglophone Africa, where religion is kind of in the public sphere in different ways. So in Francophone Africa, there's a lot of challenge to the kind of French state model of secularism. It's associated with a kind of old generation of politicians. It's coming under challenge from the uses of religion by jihadist groups and other types of things. Uh, in Anglophone Africa, for example, in Nigeria, we have Pentecostal groups that are part of, sort of demobilization campaigns. In many ways across Africa, religious groups are also part of kind of filling these gaps left by structural adjustment and many other forms of retrenchment. So religion has this big role to play. Uh, so what's your view on kind of democracy, religion, and security? Thank you very much. I, I, I'll, just, I'll just pick on something you said about Pentecostalism in Nigeria. One of the things you will notice is that Pentecostalism in Nigeria actually received a boom during structural adjustment. When the state withdrew from its welfare rule and people were left, you know, hanging in there. A lot of families, people, breadwinners lost their jobs. Uh, a lot of people even lost their lands, property. And so they had nowhere to turn to. And the only thing that was left was hope. And that, was, that is something that is not in short supply in the Pentecostal churches. And there's also the economic dimension to the Pentecostal churches that a lot of people who ordinarily would have gone into other professions also received the calling, so to speak. And so for them, church became business. And because there's, there's a huge number of alienated, hungry people, not hungry not just in terms of food, but people hungry for meaning, something to look forward to, something to hope for, a miracle, or in the words of the adherents, a breakthrough. There are too many people that are hoping for a breakthrough. And this is the only way because they don't see a breakthrough coming from government because they see the government as people out there. And so that reconnect is when the people are reconnected to the state. Now, they've been disconnected. And one of the gaps that are being filled, the, one of the actors that are filling those gaps are religious organizations, one of which is the Pentecostal movement. But you will also know from field work in, 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 in Northeast Nigeria, that some of the Islamist movements also do welfare. They build schools, they offer food, they give loans. Again, because of the gap that has been created between the state that has been disconnected from the people. Um, so what is gonna happen in the future when the state reconnects with the people in a real democratic form? Will that, be, will that need still exist? That's a question. If people graduate from college and can find a job and can find decent accommodation, access to healthcare, will they really need the hope when their future is already guaranteed? That basic welfare component, when it's not there, a lot of things go bad. When the state is not present in the lives of people or delivering or facilitating the delivery of tangible things to them. And it's because of that delegitimization of the state that you see people turning to other authority figures and authority spaces. And I'm saying that because the illiberal democracies that we have have not paid, they don't, they don't seem to understand that their relevance, their legitimacy is only to the extent that they can deliver these things. We will always have to 
build the capacities of militaries. We would always have to do security sector reform. We would always have to do demilitarization. We would also have to always put in troops to peacekeeping troops because the social sources of this discontent that continues to simmer is because of this disconnect. So we have to go back to the fundamental thing. Even the Pentecostal churches or the Islamic churches or the and they are also oriental, they are religions also from India and China coming to Africa. Everybody is coming there because there's a market for hope, because they give people hope. And for some people, they give them money because a lot of people believe that they can deliver miracles that can transform their lives. They can give them breakthroughs. And so they are also ready to invest in what I call the faith industry. But if we have a social basis, a new social contract that delivers concrete dividends, so to speak, in the name of democracy to people. And it, yes, it's true, it may not be liberal democracy, but liberal democracy itself is a historical product. And what liberal democracy is doing to the Western democracies now Western thinkers need to think of re-democratizing the West. Because liberal democracy was a product of a particular history and a particular revolution against feudalism. Feudalism is basically long dead, and if it survives, it's symbolic. What and how can Western democracies deal with the inequalities and inequities? Inequities that are actually causing so much anxiety in Western society. That's the question. I mean, nobody could have imagined an assault of capital in the world's largest and strongest democracy, challenging a revered institution. That in itself is a symbol that something needs to be reformed or revised. But how is it going to be done? Do you do it by repeating what has been done before, or do you chart a new course? And it's that new course that I am calling re-democratization. It's not an abandonment of democracy, but actually a reinforcing of democracy to respond to the social needs of the moment and to build a foundation for an alternate future that responds to the same age-old principles of democracy. I'll hop in with a, with a quick question then. Uh, thanks for your talk and for these uh, provocative remarks. Uh, Cyril, uh, youth in many African contexts now are trying to navigate uncertainty and anxiety, as you've mentioned. Do you feel like, given your remarks and the answers to the questions that you've provided, that these youth want democracy or do they actually want a radical redistribution of resources? And I ask you, can they have a, can you have a radical redistribution of resources without democracy? It's called revolution. <laughs> you said it, I didn't say it. <laughs> and even then, it has to be a democratic revolution. So you see, we agree. And when I was asked to give a keynote, I, I said, I'm going to come to talk to my audience to interrogate certain things. And I don't know if I've succeeded in doing that. So I didn't want to come with a standard text to say, let's look at the various ways in which we support capacities to demilitarize, to do peacekeeping, to do security sector reform, to do transitional justice. But let's go to the heart of the matter social organization because that is the greatest challenge we have and we live as you said in a period of great anxiety and uncertainty and nobody does well nobody does well in a period of uncertainty and anxiety but we have to go back to the basics that you're right that part of what people want is not just redistribution they want justice because if you redistribute and you don't give justice then you redistribute to the people who already have. But it has to be redistribution with justice and equity. And we live in a globally interconnected world 
Now, if the conditions in Africa, if you are able to do a new social contract on the basis of redemocratization, and you can redistribute, and you can give justice, a lot of the young people would actually find life meaningful. The uncertainty would go, the anxiety would go. And the whole industry around doing peace and security will be radically transformed. The beautiful thing actually is that on itself, the concept of security is being unpacked. It's not just about arms anymore. It's not about the military anymore. Climate change is throwing a whole complete different complexion. Environmental issues are throwing a completely, the public health crisis is throwing. So even security, actually for now, the international community has a lot more to do in those other aspects of security that would actually do prevent the entire breakdown of systems that require these massive amounts of resources that do not address the fundamentals. Can you imagine how much has been spent on international peacekeeping in the past 10 years? How many of those wars have been resolved? Look at, I'll give you an example. Look at Afghanistan. Do you know how much was spent in Afghanistan? Do you think Af Afghanistan is now more peaceful? Do you think so? If you use a fraction of that to address the social underpinnings of discontent and grievance, you could prevent those kind of issues. And do you think that Iraq uh, is more peaceful? So one of the things that I think we as social scientists and scholars and, 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 and um, practitioners need to do is to begin to look at alternative paradigms. We should keep the dominant paradigms, but we also begin to explore other paradigms. Because once the dominant paradigms become outmoded, it's those two paradigms that you will need. And for selfish reasons, that's the only way we can keep ourselves in business, by the way. Because if we keep saying the same thing and people are going to the field and they see that those solutions that we've been saying for the past 10, 20 years are not working, they won't listen to us anymore. You don't want to know who they'll be listening to. You're laughing because you know who they'll be listening to. And we don't want that. Because those guys have no solutions. All they just want to do is just to attack the enemy. But that is not the solution. That's, not not, that's not what is going to bring about sustainable peace for us. That's not what is, not, that's not what is going to give us the capacity to address the fallouts of, of, uh, of climate change, which cannot be tackled by one country, but actually re require a concerted effort across board, across regions. And then the whole question of international peace and security would actually be humanized. And when you humanize and not dehumanize international security, then we are getting closer to the solution that societies can live in real harmony. And it's not just about um, one-upmanship, one power against another power, but everybody together will become powers. And it's not the power of the gun, but the power of peace. Yes. I've been wanting to ask that question, but, but now that you bring it back, uh, bring it up, kind of change. Um, <laughs> I'm working on climate security in West Africa right now. Wow. I've been for a few years now and trying to build that project. And I'm totally on board with your idea of you don't call it revolution, but I think Adam put it well. He did. Yeah, I know he did. I know he did. Uh, 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 and I know that's what you're also saying, and, and I agree with you, and so on and so forth. But if you take into account climate change, I, I, I'm going through right now the IPCC report, uh, the work, work, uh, working group two on the causes or, part, pardon me, the consequences of climate change. And obviously, there's a whole chapter dedicated to Africa. And it, it, let's put it that way, it's, it's not looking good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and so my point, I guess, or, or the two things of the wrench I'm throwing basically into this is one, there's a sense of urgency there. Uh, uh, your revolution, in, a word, in other words, is running out of time. Um, 
And it's also out of the hands of Africans because the ultimate solution, I mean, in climate security, they talk about it as if we need to build resilience and blah, blah, blah. Africa is the most vulnerable uh, continent uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But they, there's nothing about climate mitigation because climate mitigation is obviously elsewhere. It has to be done in Europe, in North America, in China, mostly India. So the big uh, uh, CO2 emission uh, emitters, right? Um, so there's a sense of urgency and there's a fact that Africa has nothing, this very little in terms of the future of global climate change. And so I, I cannot help but be very pessimistic. I'm, I, I apologize. And, and so I'm hoping you can give me some hope. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm just wondering how you deal with those because both urgency and the fact that the, the center of power is about climate diplomacy are elsewhere. And, and uh, if you look at COP26, uh, you know, in Glasgow last fall, they don't listen to African leaders or uh, small island country leaders. They listen to oil industry leaders still in 2021, 2022. Um, so anyway, sorry to throw that wrench, but uh, well, I, I think you actually uh, you've made some very interesting points, and the, the good thing about what you just said is actually uh, you're going back to the, quest, the the core issue of this this conference, which is building capacity, and for me, it's not out of Africa's hands because there is no way the rest of the world can insulate itself if africa goes down the tubes in terms of climate change so it's partly the interest in the interest of the world to make sure that africa's interests are accommodated and respected that's the first point the second point is are the people around the table speaking on africa's behalf are they part of the illiberal democrats or are they what I call the new Democrats? So it goes back to the point that part of the issue is the international community has the choice of supporting those who truly will represent the interests of Africa and the future of Africa, or those who are interested in sustaining themselves in power and exchanging international support for the ability to perpetuate themselves in power. The international community has that choice. So again, if Africa was represented by different cast of actors, they may not be able to say, they may not be able to turn the tables, but they will not say yes to everything that is thrown at them. So you see that connection again between re-democratizing Africa and re-democratizing the world. That if the world runs on different assumptions about humanity and the kind of things that would truly liberate mankind in the long term and equitable distribution of resources and opportunities, those core principles of dignity and emancipation, if the world takes this more seriously and Africa is doing this, then there will be a basis for a real global conversation on how to address these issues. So there is hope, but hope would only lie if there is real change. Then you run into the temporal challenge, right? The time is short. Time so, is shorter, right? Yes. So we come back and we say there is hope, but is there hope for real change with the kind of anxieties and uncertainties that we are facing now? I think humanity would need to understand that time is running out and that we should begin to take those steps that would rearrange the social order on more equitable and emancipatory terms. That way, uh, we will not be, we will not think that it's out of the hands of Africans or out of the hands of anybody. We would only begin to think of how we can collaborate and have a new social compact that will bring everybody to the table, joining hands to begin to address those issues.
Um, so I, I think it's a it's a it's a note of uh, a certain uh, realism and optimism combined uh, that we leave on. I think it's a good it's a good place to do so. I want to sincerely thank Dr. Obi for uh, a very enlightening <laughs> keynote address. Um, and to say that that uh, that uh, you know it's certainly quite enriching a uh, way to, to end the day. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, as as do we all, and and that does indeed conclude this workshop. I thank you, thank everybody for participating for uh, making this a really really enriching experience. It's very very much down to all of you. Um, a couple of thank yous at quelques remerciements à la toute fin. D'abord à ma collaboratrice Marie-Ève Desrosiers pour tout l'effort que tu as consacré. Abdou Harim Lema Mohamed, encore une fois, notre chargé de projet euh, euh, qui euh, a fait un travail euh, redoutable. Encore une fois, Abir Sami qui a euh, fait le design euh, du, de, de notre affiche. Et je, je, je tiens à remercier euh, le réseau d'analyse stratégique de son appui financier euh, qui a été vraiment, euh, c'est dans le cadre de tout, euh, euh, de, de tout ce réseau que cet événement a eu lieu et de ses euh, formidables efforts en termes de publicité en termes de la production de programmes et finalement également l'appui financier de la chaire de recherche du Canada euh, sur la violence politique qui était tenue par, euh, par Lee Seymour et, et à lui euh, et à Lee euh, lui-même. Euh, sur ce, euh, ça conclut l'atelier. Merci encore une fois très chaleureusement à tout le monde, à tous nos présidents, présidentes et à tous les intervenants d'avoir vraiment euh, construit une très belle journée, très beau retour je pense pour tout le monde euh, aux événement en présentiel académique. Il fait du bien, n'est-ce pas? Merci beaucoup et, et, et bonne soirée à, à, à tout le monde.